skeletons or fragments and excavating, excavate them using clean, clean suits. And they found three um, fragments of bone from Dibia Cave. Uh, and these three bones, two are from the same level and are 38,000 and 44,000 respectively. One is older, but we don't know, we don't have a good radiocarbon date because the collagen wasn't good. Um, we know that there are three females from the work that they did, and we also know that there are three different individuals, although two of the individuals share the same mitochondrial sequence. But when you look at the nuclear DNA, they're different. So we know it's three, in the three different individuals. So what they did, basically, is extract DNA, uh, they then attached adapters to the DNA, uh, and with the new sequencing technology, you basically take an extract and you sequence everything in it. And with, with these new sequencers, you can get several million sequences in one run. Great. The only problem is, when you're working with ancient DNA, most of the sequences that you get are bacteria from the soil, fungi from the soil, phage DNA, stuff you've never heard of and you don't know what it is, uh, and it's a really tiny, tiny percentage that is actually what you're interested in. So they came up with a way to try to enrich the sample for what they're interested in. And they used the fact that human DNA and bacterial DNA are slightly different in terms of certain cut sites. So they used little enzyme scissors to try to cut up all the bacterial DNA and leave what was human or primate. So they did that to enrich, and that helped improve the number of sequences. And what they ultimately got was 1.6x coverage of the genome on average in 60% of the genome. So if you've been listening to all the human genome stuff, you know that a huge chunk of our genome is repetitive DNA. And it's hard to deal with. It, it's hard to interpret. So it's really the single copy stuff that's interesting, and that's what they focus on. So when they do the analysis, um, they did a number of things. To get the same region from a, a variety of people, they actually also did a couple modern individuals. So they would have the same regions and the same kind of coverage similar types of data analysis. Uh, and what they found was, um, if you look at Neanderthal versus Homo sapiens, the average genome divergence is about 825,000 years. The average population divergence that translates into is about 270 to 440,000 years. Now, what does that mean? Why are there two different dates? Well, in this room is the human species but our genomes diverged, not today, we're all one population, uh, but actually it goes to the depth of our earliest ancestry back here, which is somewhere in 100 to 200,000 years ago. Okay, So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, this is the date where, if you look at the diversity in the genome, it all coalesces back to that point in the past, Populations have standing diversity into them, and so you have to predict a, a more recent date as to the actual population divergence time. Okay, oh, well, now you notice that there was a little bar indicating that there was some admixture, and that was what everybody was really interested in. Did they mate? What if they mated? I should have done a slide with that for the picture, but. Um, so that was something that people were really, really wondering about. And what we, what they find is that if you look at the Neanderthal relative to an African, uh, and they had a couple of Africans in their sample, um, you get sort of this straight line here. And this is the average Neanderthal uh, 
percent, which explains why we don't see it in the mitochondrial DNA, why nobody in this room has mitochondrial, you know, Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. So um, to, fin to finish up here, how are we different? about evolutionary theory in general is that it yields uh, predictions about what should happen given certain circumstances, given certain assumptions, just as you do in engineering, uh, about events and how they play out under certain defined causes, natural selection, etc. We can use what we know about the operation of natural selection and other evolutionary forces in populations Okay. And then, as we do in all of science, take what we know about the modern world, all historical science, what we know about the modern world, and project it back into the past under the assumptions of uniformitarianism, which basically say the forces that have been operating on the planet, or operating on the planet today, have always operated. Okay. And this is known, well accepted. And when we do that, we find that in many cases, we feel comfortable with the inferences we make about the past, because that's all we can do is make inferences about the past. Uh, we, we 
We have no time machines yet. Man's lab hasn't turned one up yet. But uh, we'll pay you more. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and it makes sense because when we put together the picture of the of the fossils, the archaeology, the geology, and the climate and the genetics, all of the indicators tend to point in the same direction in most cases. And that's, that's what happens in science. So it's not engineering, but it is science. I was going to you there. The genetics, you know, is, it, it will give you much the same story. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, although I did not say the word in my talk, we, we use a lot of simulations and, and we talk a lot in terms of the likelihoods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you can various models under statistical population genetics and figure out, you know, so I gave you a range of one to four percent admixture, and that's based on likelihood models of admixture over time given various parameters. And um, and it fits with with simulations that were done with mitochondrial data saying, okay, what if you don't see any modern Neanderthal uh, mitochondrial DNA today, what are the likelihoods that they interbred? And the estimates that were done at that time were somewhere from zero to as much as 10 or 15 percent, but the highest log likelihood was zero <laughs> based on the mitochondrial. So um, with five or ten individuals, I think. Um, so the nice thing is that if we, there are many Neanderthal skeletons, um, a lot of them don't have DNA that's preserved, but uh, there are uh, multiple samples that can be tested and probably will be. And so we are likely to get additional data points. Um, and I think, you know, I started in ancient DNA in, in 20, some years ago, believe it or not, I was, as a child. <laughs> um, you know, it is incredible how fast the technology, and of course, getting, I didn't indicate how much data you get from these sequencers, but we have to work very closely with bioinformaticians to handle the giant Say one, one final word. You know, um, the, the paleoanthropology or the historical sciences in general are a lot like uh, physics. Actually, no one has ever seen a subatomic particle, but we've seen traces of them based on the design of experiments that test theories that you know, phys theoretical physicists come up with. We make predictions, we conduct the experiments, you see the traces of the particles. Same thing in paleoanthropology. We have theories. Go out to the field, we find fossils, we examine the fossils, which are the same, there are the traces, right? And we see if there